Chapter 3 of Langstroth on the Hive and the Honey Bee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, August 2009, Alexandria, Virginia. Langstroth on the Hive and the Honey Bee by L. L. Langstroth. Chapter 3 the queen or mother bee, the drones, and the workers, with various highly important facts in their natural history. Bees can flourish only when associated in large numbers, as a colony. In a solitary state, a single bee is almost as helpless as a newborn child. It is unable to endure even the ordinary chill of a cool summer night. If a strong colony of bees is examined, a short time before it swarms, three different kinds of bees will be found in the hive. First, a bee of peculiar shape, commonly called the queen bee. Second, some hundreds, more or less, of large bees called drones. Third, many thousands of a smaller kind, called workers or common bees, and similar to those which are seen on the blossoms. A large number of the cells will be found filled with honey and bee bread, while vast numbers contain eggs and immature workers and drones. A few cells of unusual size are devoted to the rearing of young queens, and are ordinarily to be found in a perfect condition only in the swarming season. The queen bee is the only perfect female in the hive, and all the eggs are laid by her. The drones are the males, and the workers are females, whose ovaries, or egg bags, are so imperfectly developed that they are incapable of breeding, and which retain the instinct of females only so far as to give the most devoted attention to feeding and rearing the brood. These facts have all been demonstrated repeatedly, and are as well established as the most common facts in the breeding of our domestic animals. The knowledge of them, in their most important bearings, is absolutely essential to all those who expect to realize large profits from an improved method of rearing bees. Those who will not acquire the necessary information, if they keep bees at all, should manage them in the old-fashioned way, which requires the smallest amount either of knowledge or skill. I am perfectly aware how difficult it is to reason with a large class of beekeepers, some of whom have been so often imposed upon that they have lost all faith in the truth of any statements which may be made by anyone interested in a patent hive, while others stigmatize all knowledge which does not square with their own as book knowledge and unworthy the attention of practical men. If any such read this book, let me remind them again, that all my assertions may be put to the test. So long as the interior of a hive was to common observers a profound mystery, ignorant and designing men might assert what they pleased, about what passed in its dark recesses. But now, when all that takes place in it can, in a few moments, be exposed to the full light of day, and every one who keeps bees can see and examine for himself the man who attempts to palm upon the community his own conceits for facts will speedily earn for himself the character both of a fool and an impostor. The queen bee, or as she may be more properly called the mother bee, is the common mother of the whole colony. She reigns, therefore, most unquestionably, by a divine right, as every mother is, or ought to be, a queen in her own family. Her shape is entirely different from that of the other bees. While she is not near so bulky as a drone, her body is longer, and of a more tapering or sugar-loaf form than that of a worker, so that she has somewhat of a wasp-like appearance. Her wings are much shorter, in proportion, than those of the drone, or worker. The under part of her body is of a golden color, 
and the upper part darker than that of the other bees. Her motions are unusually slow and matronly, although she can, when she pleases, move with astonishing quickness. No colony can long exist without the presence of this all-important insect. She is just as necessary to its welfare as the soul is to the body, for a colony without a queen must as certainly perish as a body without the spirit hasten to inevitable decay. She is treated by the bees, as every mother ought to be, by her children, with the most unbounded respect and affection. A circle of her loving offspring constantly surround her, testifying, in various ways, their dutiful regard, offering her honey, from time to time, and always, most politely getting out of her way, to give her a clear path when she wishes to move over the combs. If she is taken from them, as soon as they have ascertained their loss, the whole colony is thrown into a state of the most intense agitation. All the labors of the hive are at once abandoned. The bees run wildly over the combs, and frequently the whole of them rush forth from the hive, and exhibit all the appearance of anxious search for their beloved mother. Not being able anywhere to find her, they return to their desolate home, and by their mournful tones reveal their deep sense of so deplorable a calamity. Their note, at such times, more especially when they first realize her loss, is of a peculiarly mournful character, it sounds something like a succession of wails on the minor key, and can no more be mistaken by the experienced beekeeper for their ordinary, happy hum than the piteous moanings of a sick child can be confounded by an anxious mother with its joyful crowings when overflowing with health and happiness. I am perfectly aware that all this will sound to many, much more like romance than sober reality. But I have determined, in writing this book, to state facts, however wonderful, just as they are, confident that they will, before long, be universally received, and hoping that the many wonders in the economy of the honey-bee will not only excite a wider interest in its culture, but will lead those who observe them, to adore the wisdom of him who gave them such admirable instincts. I cannot refrain from quoting here the forcible remarks of an English clergyman, who appears to be a very great enthusiast in bee culture. Quote, Every beekeeper, if he have only a soul to appreciate the works of God, and an intelligence of an inquisitive order, cannot fail to become deeply interested in observing the wonderful instincts, instincts akin to reason, of these admirable creatures, at the same time that he will learn many lessons of practical wisdom from their example. Having acquired a knowledge of their habits, not a bee will buzz in his ear without recalling to him some of these lessons, and helping to make him a wiser and a better man. It is certain that in all my experience I never yet met with a keeper of bees who was not a respectable, well-conducted member of society, and a moral, if not a religious man. It is evident, on reflection, that this pursuit, if well attended to, must occupy some considerable share of a man's time and thoughts. He must be often about his bees which will help to counteract the baneful effect of the village inn. Whoever is fond of his bees is fond of his home, is an axiom of irrefragable truth, and one which ought to kindle in everyone's breast a favorable regard for a pursuit which has the power to produce so happy an influence. The love of home is the companion of many other virtues, which, if not yet developed into actual exercise, are still only dormant, and may be roused into wakeful energy at any moment. End quote. The fertility of the queen bee has been much underestimated by most writers. 
it is truly astonishing. During the height of the breeding season, she will often, under favorable circumstances, lay from two to three thousand eggs a day. In my observing hives, I have seen her lay at the rate of six eggs a minute. The fecundity of the female of the white ant is much greater than this, as she will lay as many as sixty eggs a minute. But then her eggs are simply extruded from her body, to be carried by the workers into suitable nurseries, while the queen bee herself deposits her eggs in their appropriate cells. On the way in which the eggs of the queen bee are fecundated, I come now to a subject of great practical importance, and one which, until quite recently, has been attended with apparently insuperable difficulties. It has been noted that the queen bee commences laying in the latter part of winter, or early in spring, and long before there are any drones or males in the hive. See remarks on drones. In what way are these eggs impregnated? Huber, by a long course of the most indefatigable observations, threw much light upon this subject. Before stating his discoveries, I must pay my humble tribute of gratitude and admiration to this wonderful man. It is mortifying to every scientific naturalist, and I might add, to every honest man acquainted with the facts, to hear such a man as Huber abused by the veriest quacks and impostors, while others who have appropriated from his labors nearly all that is of any value in their works, to use the words of Pope, damn with faint praise, assent with civil leer, and without sneering, teach the rest to sneer. Huber, in early manhood, lost the use of his eyes. His opponents imagine that, in stating this fact, they have thrown merited discredit on all his pretended discoveries. But to make their case still stronger, they delight to assert that he saw everything through the medium of his servant Francis Burnens, an ignorant peasant. Now this ignorant peasant was a man of strong native intellect, possessing that indefatigable energy and enthusiasm which are so indispensable to make a good observer. He was a noble specimen of a self-made man, and afterwards rose to be the chief magistrate in the village where he resided. Huber has paid the most admirable tribute to his intelligence, fidelity, and indomitable patience, energy, and skill. It would be difficult to find, in any language, a better specimen of the true Baconian or inductive system of reasoning than Huber's work upon bees, and it might be studied as a model of the only true way of investigating nature so as to arrive at reliable results. Huber was assisted in his investigations, not only by Burnens, but by his own wife, to whom he was engaged before the loss of his sight, and who nobly persisted in marrying him, notwithstanding his misfortune, and the strenuous dissuasions of her friends. They lived for more than the ordinary term of human life, in the enjoyment of uninterrupted domestic happiness, and the amiable naturalist scarcely felt, in her assiduous attentions, the loss of his sight. Milton is believed by many to have been a better poet for his blindness, and it is highly probable that Huber was a better apiarian for the same cause. His active and yet reflective mind demanded constant employment, and he found in the study of the habits of the honey-bee full scope for all his powers. All the facts observed, and experiments tried by his faithful assistants, were daily reported to him, and many inquiries were stated and suggestions made by him, which would probably have escaped his notice if he had possessed the use of his eyes. Few have such a command of both time and money, as to enable them to carry on, for a series of years, 
on a grand scale, the most costly experiments. Aperians owe more to Huber than to any other person. I have repeatedly verified the most important of his observations, and I take the greatest delight in acknowledging my obligations to him, and in holding him up to my countrymen as the Prince of Aperians. My readers will pardon this digression. It would have been morally impossible for me to write a work on bees, without saying at least as much as this, in vindication of Huber. I return to his discoveries on the impregnation of the queen bee, by a long course of experiments most carefully conducted. He ascertained that, like many other insects, she is fecundated in the open air, and on the wing, and that the influence of this lasts for several years, and probably for life. He could not form any satisfactory conjecture as to the way in which the eggs, which were not yet developed in her ovaries, could be fertilized. Years ago, the celebrated Dr. John Hunter and others supposed that there must be a permanent receptacle for the male sperm opening into the passage for the eggs called the oviduct. Sierson, who must be regarded as one of the ablest contributors of modern times to Aperian science, maintains this opinion, and states that he has found such a receptacle filled with a fluid resembling the semen of the drones. He nowhere, to my knowledge, states that he ever made microscopic examinations, so as to put the matter on the footing of demonstration. In January and February of 1852, I submitted several queen bees to Dr. Joseph Lady of Philadelphia for a scientific examination. I need hardly to say to any naturalist in this country that Dr. Lady has obtained the very highest reputation, both at home and abroad, as a skillful naturalist and microscopic anatomist. No man in this country or Europe was more competent to make the investigations that I desired. He found in making his dissections a small globular sac, not larger than a grain of mustard seed, about one thirty-third of an inch in diameter, communicating with the oviduct and filled with a whitish fluid, which when examined under the microscope was found to abound in spermatozoa or the animaculae, which are the unmistakable characteristics of the seminal fluid. Later in the season, the same substance was compared with some taken from the drones, and found to be exactly similar to it. These examinations have settled, on the impregnable basis of demonstration, the mode in which the eggs of the queen are vivified. In descending the oviduct to be deposited in the cells, they pass by the mouth of this seminal sac, or spermatheca, and receive a portion of its fertilizing contents. Small as it is, its contents are sufficient to impregnate hundreds of thousands of eggs. In precisely the same way, the mother wasps and hornets are fecundated. The females alone of these insects survive the winter, and they begin, single-handed, the construction of a nest, in which, at first, only a few eggs are deposited. How could these eggs hatch, if the females which laid them had not been impregnated the previous season? Dissection proves them to have a spermatheca similar to that of the queen bee. Of all who have written against Huber, no one has treated him with more unfairness, misrepresentation, and, I might almost add, malignity than whoish. He maintains that the eggs of the queen are impregnated by the drones, after she has deposited them in the cells, and accounts for the fact that brood is produced in the spring, long before the existence of any drones in the hive, by asserting that these eggs were deposited and impregnated late in the previous season, and have remained dormant all winter in the hive. And yet the same writer, 
while ridiculing the discoveries of Huber, advises that all the mother wasps should be killed in the spring to prevent them from founding families to commit depredations upon the bees. It never seems to have occurred to him that the existence of a permanently impregnated mother wasp was just as difficult to be accounted for as the existence of a similarly impregnated queen bee. EFFECT OF RETARDED IMPREGNATION ON THE QUEEN BEE I shall now mention a fact in the physiology of the queen bee more singular than any which has yet been related. Huber, while experimenting to ascertain how the queen was fecundated, confined some of his young queens to their hives by contracting the entrances so that they were not able to go in search of the drones until three weeks after their birth. To his amazement, these queens whose impregnation was thus unnaturally retarded never laid any eggs, but such as produced drones. He tried the experiment again and again, but always with the same result. Some beekeepers, long before his time, had observed that all the brood in a hive were occasionally drones, and of course, that such colonies rapidly went to ruin. Before attempting any explanation of this astonishing fact, I must call the attention of the reader to another of the mysteries of the beehive. Fertile Workers It has already been remarked that the workers are proved by dissection to be females, all of which, under ordinary circumstances, are barren. Occasionally, some of them appear to be more fully developed than common, so as to be capable of laying eggs. These eggs, like those of queens whose impregnation has been retarded, always produce drones. Sometimes, when a colony has lost its queen, these drone-laying workers are exalted to her place and treated with equal respect and affection by the bees. Huber ascertained that these fertile workers were generally reared in the neighborhood of the young queens, and he thought that they received some particles of the peculiar food or jelly on which the queens are reared. See Royal Jelly. He did not pretend to account for the effect of retarded impregnation. He made no experiments to determine the facts as to the fecundation of these fertile workers. Since the publication of Huber's work, nearly fifty years ago, no light has been shed upon the mysteries of drone-laying queens and workers until quite recently. Searsone appears to have been the first to ascertain the truth on this subject, and his discovery must certainly be ranked as unfolding one of the most astonishing facts in all the range of animated nature. This fact seems at first view, so absolutely incredible, that I should not dare to mention it, if it were not supported by the most indubitable evidence, and if I had not, as I have already observed, determined to state all important and well-ascertained facts, without seeking, by any concealments, to pander to the prejudices of conceited and often very ignorant beekeepers. Sierson advances the opinion that impregnation is not needed in order that the eggs of the queen may produce drones, but that all impregnated eggs produce females, either workers or queens, and all unimpregnated ones, males or drones. He states that he found drone-laying queens in several of his hives whose wings were so imperfect that they could not fly, and that on examination they proved to be unfecundated. Hence he concluded that the eggs of the queen bee or fertile worker had from the previous impregnation of the egg which produced them sufficient vitality to produce the drone, which is a less highly organized insect and one inferior to the queen or workers. It had long been known that the queen deposits drone eggs in the large or drone cells, 
and worker eggs in the small or worker cells, and that she makes no mistakes. Searson inferred, therefore, that there was some way in which she was able to decide as to the sex of the egg before it was laid, and that she must have a control over the mouth of the seminal sac, so as to be able to extrude her eggs, allowing them to receive or not, just as she pleased, a portion of its fertilizing contents. In this way, he thought she determined the sex, according to the size of the cells in which she laid them. Mr. Samuel Wagner of York, Pennsylvania, has recently communicated to me a very original and exceedingly ingenious theory of his own, which he thinks will account for all the facts without admitting that the queen bee has any special knowledge or will on the subject. He supposes that, when she deposits her eggs in the worker cells, her body is slightly compressed by the size of the cells, and that the eggs, as they pass the spermatheca, receive in this manner its vivifying influence. On the contrary, when she is egg-laying in drone cells, this compression cannot take place. The mouth of the spermatheca is kept closed, and the eggs are, necessarily, unfecundated. This theory may prove to be true, but at present it is encumbered with some difficulties and requires further investigation before it can be considered as fully established. Leaving then the question whether the queen exercises any volition in this manner, for the present undecided, I shall state some facts which occurred in the summer of 1852 in my own apiary, and shall then endeavor to relieve, as far as possible, this intricate subject from some of the difficulties which embarrass it. In the autumn of 1852, my assistant found, in one of my hives, a young queen, the whole of whose progeny was drones. The colony had been formed by removing part of the combs containing bees, brood and eggs, from another hive. It had only a few combs, and but a small number of bees. They raised a new queen in the manner which will hereafter be particularly described. This queen had laid a number of eggs in one of the combs, and the young bees from some of them were already emerging from the cells. I perceived, at the first glance, that they were drones. As there were none but worker cells in the hive, they were reared in them, and not having space for full development, they were dwarfed in size, although the bees, in order to give them more room, had pieced out the cells so as to make them larger than usual. Size accepted, they appeared as perfect as any other drones. I was not only struck with the singularity of finding drones reared in worker cells, but with the equally singular fact that a young queen, who at first lays only the eggs of workers, should be laying drone eggs at all, and at once conjectured that this was a case of a drone-laying, unimpregnated queen, as sufficient time had not elapsed for her impregnation to be unnaturally retarded. I saw the great importance of taking all necessary precautions to determine this point, the queen was removed from the hive, and carefully examined. Her wings, although they appear to be perfect, were so paralyzed that she could not fly. It seemed probable, therefore, that she had never been able to leave the hive for impregnation. To settle the question beyond the possibility of doubt, I submitted this queen to Dr. Joseph Lady for microscopic examination. The following is an extract from his report. Quote, the ovaries were filled with eggs, the poison sac was full of fluid, and I took the whole of it into my mouth. The poison produced a strong metallic taste, lasting for a considerable time, and at first it was pungent to the tip of the tongue. The spermatheca was distended with a perfectly colorless, transparent, viscid liquid, without a trace of spermatozoa. 
End quote. This examination seems perfectly to sustain the theory of Sierson, and to demonstrate that queens do not need to be impregnated in order to lay the eggs of males. I must confess that very considerable doubts rested on my mind as to the accuracy of Sierson's statements on this subject, and chiefly because of his having hazarded the unfortunate conjecture that the place of the poison bag in the worker is occupied in the queen by the spermatheca. Now this is so completely contrary to fact that it was a very natural inference that this acute and thoroughly honest observer made no microscopic dissections of the insects which he examined. I consider myself peculiarly fortunate in having enjoyed the benefit of the labors of a naturalist, so celebrated as Dr. Lady, for microscopic dissections. The exceeding minuteness of some of the insects, which he has completely figured and described, almost passes belief. On examining this same colony a few days later, I obtained the most satisfactory evidence that these drone eggs were laid by the queen which had been removed. No fresh eggs had been deposited in the cells, and the bees, on missing her, had commenced the construction of royal cells to rear, if possible, another queen, a thing which they would not have done if a fertile worker had been present, by which the drone eggs had been laid. Another very interesting fact proves that all the eggs laid by this queen were drone eggs. Two of the royal cells were, in a short time, discontinued, and were found to be empty, while a third contained a worm, which was sealed over the usual way, to undergo its changes from a worm to a perfect queen. I was completely at a loss to account for this, as the bees having an unimpregnated drone-laying queen ought not to have had a single female egg from which they could rear a queen. At first I imagined they might have stolen it from another hive, but when I opened this cell, it contained, instead of a queen, a dead drone. I then remembered that Huber had described the same mistake on the part of some of his bees. At the base of this cell was an extraordinary quantity of the peculiar jelly or paste, which is fed to the young that are to be transformed into queens. The poor bees in their desperation appeared to have dosed the unfortunate drone to death, as though they expected, by such liberal feeding, to produce some hopeful change in his sexual organization. It appears to me that these facts constitute all the links in a perfect chain, and demonstrate beyond the possibility of doubt that unfecundated queens are not only capable of laying eggs, this would be no more remarkable than the same occurrence in a hen, but that these eggs are possessed of sufficient vitality to produce drones. Aristotle, who flourished before the Christian era, had noticed that there was no difference in appearance between the eggs producing drones and those producing workers, and he states that drones only are produced in hives, which have no queen. Of course the eggs producing them were laid by fertile workers. Having now the aid of powerful microscopes, we are still unable to detect the slightest difference in size or appearance in the eggs, and this is precisely what we should expect if the same egg will produce either a worker or a drone, according as it is or is not impregnated. The theory which I propose will, I think, perfectly harmonize with all the observed facts on this subject. I believe that after fecundation has been delayed for about three weeks, the mouth of the spermatheca becomes permanently closed, so that impregnation can no longer be effected, just as the parts of a flower, after a certain time, wither and shut up 
and the plant is incapable of fructification. The fertile drone-laying workers are, in my opinion, physically incapable of being impregnated. However strange it may appear, or even improbable, that an unimpregnated egg can give birth to a living being, or that the sex can be dependent on impregnation, we are not at liberty to reject facts, because we cannot comprehend the reasons of them. He who allows himself to be guilty of such folly, if he seeks to maintain his consistency, will be plunged, sooner or later, into the dreary gulf of atheism. Common sense, philosophy, and religion alike teach us to receive all undoubted facts in the natural and the spiritual world, with becoming reverence, assured that, however mysterious to us, they are all most beautifully harmonious and consistent in the sight of him whose understanding is infinite. There is something analogous to these wonders in the bee, in what takes place in the aphids or green lice, which infest our rose bushes and other plants. We have the most undoubted evidence that a fecundated female gives birth to other females, and they in turn to others still, all of which, without impregnation, are able to bring forth young, until at length, until a number of generations, perfect males and females are produced and the series starts anew. The unequaled facilities furnished by my hives have seemed to render it peculiarly incumbent upon me to do all in my power to clear up the difficulties in this intricate and yet highly important branch of apiarian knowledge. All the leading facts in the breeding of bees ought to be as well known to the beekeeper as the same class of facts in the rearing of his domestic animals. A few crude and hasty notions, but half understood and half digested, will answer only for the old-fashioned beekeeper who deals in the brimstone matches. He who expects to conduct beekeeping on a safe and profitable system must learn that on this, as on all other subjects, Knowledge is power. The extraordinary fertility of the queen bee has already been noticed. The process of laying has been well described by the Reverend W. Dunbar, a Scotch apiarian. Quote, when the queen is about to lay, she puts her head into a cell, and remains in that position for a second or two to ascertain its fitness for the deposit which she is about to make. She then withdraws her head, curving her body downwards, inserts the lower part of it into the cell. In a few seconds she turns half round upon herself and withdraws, leaving an egg behind her. When she lays a considerable number, she does it equally on each side of the comb, those on the one side being as exactly opposite to those on the other as the relative position of the cells will admit. The effect of this is to produce the utmost possible concentration and economy of heat for developing the various changes of the brood. End quote. Here, as at every step in the economy of the bee, our minds are filled with an admiration as we witness the perfect adaptation of means to ends. Who can blame the warmest enthusiasm of the apiarian in view of a sagacity? which seems scarcely inferior to that of man. The eggs of bees, I quote from the admirable treatise of Bevan, quote, are of a lengthened oval shape, with a slight curvature, and of a bluish-white color, being besmeared at the time of laying with a glutinous substance. They adhere to the bases of the cells, and remain unchanged in figure or situation for three or four days. They are then hatched, the bottom of each cell presenting to view a small white worm. On its growing so as to touch the opposite angle of the cell, it coils itself up, 
to use the language of Swammerdam, like a dog when going to sleep, and floats in a whitish transparent fluid, which is deposited in the cells by the nursing bees, and by which it is probably nourished. It becomes gradually enlarged in its dimensions, till the two extremities touch one another and form a ring. In this state it is called a larva or worm. So nicely do the bees calculate the quantity of food which will be required, that none remains in the cell when it is transformed into a nymph. It is the opinion of many eminent naturalists that farina does not constitute the sole food of the larva, but that it consists of a mixture of farina, honey, and water, partly digested in the stomachs of the nursing bees. End quote. The larva having derived its support, in the manner above described, for four, five, or six days, according to the season, the development being retarded in cool weather and badly protected hives, continues to increase during that period, till it occupies the whole breadth and nearly the length of the cell. The nursing bees now seal over the cell with a light brown cover, externally more or less convex. The cap of a drone cell is more convex than that of a worker, and thus differing from that of a honey cell, which is paler and somewhat concave. The cap of the brood cell appears to be made of a mixture of bee bread and wax. It is not airtight as it would be if made of wax alone, but when examined with a microscope it appears to be reticulated or full of fine holes through which the enclosed insect can have air for all necessary purposes. From its texture and shape it is easily thrust off by the bee when mature, whereas, if it consisted wholly of wax, the young bee would either perish for lack of air, or be unable to force its way into the world. Both the material and shape of the lids, which seal up the honey cells, are different, because an entirely different object was aimed at. They are of pure wax to make them airtight, and thus to prevent the honey from souring or candying in the cells. They are concave or hollowed inwards to give them greater strength to resist the pressure of their contents. To return to Bevan, quote, The larva is no sooner perfectly enclosed than it begins to line the cell by spinning round itself. After the manner of the silkworm, a whitish silky film or cocoon, by which it is encased, as it were, in a pod. When it has undergone this change, it is usually borne the name of nymph or pupa. The insect has now attained its full growth, and the large amount of nutriment which it has taken serves as a store for developing the perfect insect. The working bee nymph spins its cocoon in 36 hours, after passing about three days in the state of preparation for a new existence, it gradually undergoes so great a change as not to wear a vestige of its previous form, but becomes armed with a firmer male and with scales of a dark brown hue. On its belly six rings become distinguishable, by which slipping one over the other enables the bee to shorten its body whenever it has occasion to do so. When it has reached the twenty-first day of its existence, counting from the moment the egg is laid, it comes forth a perfect winged insect. The cocoon is left behind, and forms a closely attached and exact lining to the cell in which it was spun. By this means the breeding cells become smaller, and their partitions stronger, the oftener they change their tenants, and may become so much diminished in size as not to admit of the perfect development of full-sized bees. Such are the respective stages of the working bee. Those of the royal bee are as follows. 
she passes three days in the egg, and is five in a worm. The workers then close her cell, and she immediately begins spinning her cocoon, which occupies her twenty-four hours. On the tenth and eleventh days, and a part of the twelfth, as if exhausted by her labor, she remains in complete repose. Then she passes four days, and a part of the fifth as a nymph. It is on the sixteenth day, therefore, that the perfect state of queen is attained. The drone passes three days in the egg, six and a half as a worm, and changes into a perfect insect on the twenty-fourth or twenty-fifth day after the egg is laid. The development of each species, likewise, proceeds more slowly when colonies are weak or the air cool, and when the weather is very cold, it is entirely suspended. Dr. Hunter has observed that the eggs, worms, and nymphs all require a heat above 70 degrees of Fahrenheit for their evolution. End quote. In the chapter on protection against extremes of heat and cold, I have dwelt, at some length, upon the importance of constructing the hives in such a manner as to enable the bees to preserve, as far as possible, a uniform temperature in their tenement. In thin hives exposed to the sun, the heat is sometimes so great as to destroy the eggs and the larvae, even when the combs escape from being melted, and the cold is often so severe as to check the development of the brood, and sometimes to kill it outright. In such hives, when the temperature out of doors falls suddenly and severely, the bees at once feel the unfavorable change. They are obliged in self-defense to huddle together to keep warm, and thus large portions of the brood comb are often abandoned, and the brood either destroyed at once by the cold, or so enfeebled that they could never recover from the shock. Let every beekeeper, in all his operations, remember that brood comb must never be exposed to a low temperature so as to become chilled. The disastrous effects are almost as certain as when the eggs of a setting hen are left, for too long a time, by the careless mother. The brood combs are never safe when taken for any considerable time from the bees, unless the temperature is fully up to summer heat. Quote, the young bees break their envelope with their teeth, and assisted, as soon as they come forth, by the older ones, proceed to cleanse themselves from the moisture and exuviae with which they were surrounded. Both drones and workers on emerging from the cell are, at first gray, soft, and comparatively helpless, so that some time elapses before they take wing. With respect to the cocoons spun by the different larvae, both workers and drones spin complete cocoons, or enclose themselves on every side. Royal larvae construct only imperfect cocoons, open behind, and enveloping only the head, thorax, and first ring of the abdomen. And Huber concludes, without any hesitation, that the final course of their forming only incomplete cocoons is that they may thus be exposed to the mortal sting of the first hatched queen, whose instinct leads her instantly to seek the destruction of those who would soon become her rivals. If the royal larvae spun complete cocoons, the stings of the queen seeking to destroy their rivals might be so entangled in their meshes that they could not be disengaged. Such, says Huber, is the instinctive enmity of young queens to each other, that I have seen one of them, immediately on its emergence from the cell, rush to those of its sisters, and tear to pieces even the imperfect larvae. Hitherto philosophers have claimed our admiration of nature for her care in preserving and multiplying the species. But from these facts, 
we must now admire her precautions in exposing certain individuals to a mortal hazard. End, quote. End of chapter 3, part 1